Hey guys, it's Roderick. I'm here with another episode review of The Morning Show, Season 3, Episode 9, Update Your Priors. So if you're new to this channel, this is where we talk about films, television shows, movies, all the big ones like Kiki. And if you watch any of my other reality TV show reviews, you know that when the glasses are on, the library is open. I was on the fence last week. I was like, am I going to go in and let have? But this week today, they have tried me. So we're going to go in and let have with the, so the library is open. But we're going to close it right now because we're going to talk about some fundamentals and some themes. But I'm about to open it up on two characters in particular who I'm about to read the fuck down. So let's get started. So first thing is... The purpose of the pent, the pent Ultimate episode. So the Pent Ultimate episode is the second to last episode. It's the episode before the finale, a season finale or series finale. Now, the purpose of the Pent Ultimate episode is really to do three things, right? You bring into focus all the arcs that the characters are going through, the intersection of all the storylines into a palpable climax, that moment before the climax. So that is what you do in the Pinto episode. All of a sudden, the stakes are at its highest. All the storylines, your A, B, C, and D storylines that have been running through all the seasons are now, have now intersected. You have a ticking clock. You do not know what's going to happen, and you're sitting on the edge of your seat, right? And this episode does that. It hits the check, it hits all the marks all the spots of how you should do a pit ultimate episode for better or for worse. They did it masterfully. I, again, thoroughly enjoyed this episode. Now, let's talk about themes, right? Because there's a theme that ran through this episode I thought to be quite interesting. And I didn't catch it the first time I watched it. And I caught it halfway through the second time. And I was like, okay, what is this all about? Moral relativism, okay? So for those of you who don't know, moral relativism is a theory and philosophy that pretty much says that there really is no standard or set stage or set point of right and wrong. It's all about where you are in position to the situation, right? So murder is wrong, but it may be right based upon this, these type of circumstances, right? So your moral compass is constantly shifting and changing based upon the situation relative to where you are in the situations that you're in. That is a very boiled down, very basic, very elementary school description of what moral, relative, moral relativism, relativism is. How it plays out typically in most people's lives are is that they typically will make excuses for things that they know are bad or they know they should not do based upon their based upon where they're what they're experiencing. I know I shouldn't steal, but I'm hungry, so I'm gonna steal these steaks from the grocery store. That type of thing, right? So that's moral relativism, okay? Nevertheless, so let's start off. So we start off with Laura. Laura's going to get read down at the end of this episode, just so you know. So if you're a Laura fan, you may just want to skip to that. You may just want to just hold your breath because I'm about to read the dog fuck out of Laura, right? So Laura's having her lesbian dreams when things are nice and happy and great with Bradley or whatever. So then she wakes up all in a fluster because she can't motherfucking sleep. Okay, Laura, we'll just save that for the end. Alex, now Alex is in her refrigerator, staring at staring at her refrigerator because she doesn't know what to do because it seems like things are going so fast. Now, Paul Marks, Jungle Books, Alex back into compliance and she's like back on track. Alex is going to get read for filth too. We'll get to those two later, right? Now, Stella arrives at Bradley's house because they're pretty much like the resistance and Terminator, right? Trying to take down Paul Marks and nobody's talking to Bradley. Bradley's on the phone. People are talking and they're like, we got four days, right? So here's our ticking bomb. They have four days to get this whole done because this deal closes on, closes on Friday, right? So Corey is here looking at the proofs, feeling himself, thinking he's a titan in industry or whatever. And then Earl comes in and is like, um, have you checked the stock prices in your company lately? He's like, no, why? And so then Corey goes to look and then sees the stock prices going gradually and gradually up. Okay. So I think I mentioned this in the last episode about the potential legal loophole that you that 
the show it was had with this whole sale that they that they tried that they have buttoned up in this episode. Now, in order to sell a company, public or private, it must first be approved by the board of directors and then voted upon by the stockholders, right? So Sybil, because her grandfather owned the company, right, more than likely had a substantial, had some shares in the company, right? So the problem was, was that we never knew how many shares Sybil owned in the company. And we never, and with it being a public company, those shares are larger, right? And therefore her original ownership in the company has been diluted, right? Because you, let's say you start a company, it's like you, you, you your three friends, Everybody has a hundred shares, hundred shares, hundred shares, three hundred shares. Well, when you take that company, when you take that company public, you don't know when you have to. You don't be able to sell millions of shares, right? Now everybody gets a certain degree or certain class of shares, but they're not going to have the same type of no ownership that the other that they may that that they may have had once the company goes public, depending upon the way in which the deal works, right? So I was always wondering how they were going to get around this loophole. With the sharehold, with the with the shareholders, considering Sybil may or may not own a whole lot of shares, and we get that answer at the end of the episode, right? Anyway, so Stella tells Earl, "Go ahead, find out who's buying these shares." But Corey don't really care because he's just like you know, really feeling himself. He got four more days, and this deal's about to close or whatever, right? Now Stella's calling Kate. Kate ain't gonna be found. Her phone ain't even working. And here come Paul Marsh talking about, "Hey, Kate, how's it going?" And whatever, trying to get trying to get dirt on Corey, and and couldn't, and still was like, well, you know what? He, nothing really bad happens. He sleeps at work. He works. He may play poker with some execs. You know, whatever. And he's like, he's not a monk. Has to be up to something. She's like, child, I don't know. I don't be in his business. I be one minding my own business, right? But I did hear when Bradley first showed up, he was all you know, chummy, chummy. He may have liked her, but he clearly was barking up the wrong tree. So Paul's like, okay, thanks, right? <clears throat> now, Laura goes in, has a private meeting with her boss, who is always, who's like the Corey counterpart, right, at NBN, and it's like, I got a story, it's really close to me, but I don't know what to do, right? First of all, I love seeing Elizabeth Perkins. If you've ever watched, um, oh God, the show just escaped me with her and Mary Louise Parker, uh, Weeds. If you ever watched Weeds, she was fantastic in Weeds. Um, so I anything that she's typically in, I'd love. So anytime to see her, I was great. Back to Laura and her bullshit, right? So then Laura's whining and complaining about how she doesn't want to chase the story down. It gets severe repercussions to someone close to her or whatever. And Elizabeth Perkins provides her with the moral relativism that she needs. Because she goes, you know what? I had a friend. She was on the Ken's, one of Ken Starr's attorneys. She let some shit slip. And I went, went, went ahead and put it on the news. And the friend got mad. And she goes, well, we destroy one moral code to uphold another. Let's stop your role. You are not doctors. You are not lawyers. There is no relationship that is created between you and information. You can simply hear shit and just let it go in one ear and out the motherfucking other, right? So then the Elizabeth Perkins says, well, girl, if you all t torn up about it, well, I can pass the story off to somebody else. Let them report it. Then you don't have to worry about it. Laura refuses. We'll get to that on later on. <clears throat> now, Earl tells Corey he still can't find out who's doing it, but it's only one person and it's an LLC, right? So then Corey gets skittish. He's like, is Paul Marsh trying to make some motherfucking money on the side off this whole thing? He goes, finds Paul. is like, hey, did you tell your friends they're trying to get some extra money? He's like, I don't know. He was like, I ain't do nothing. And pretty much it doesn't matter who's buying the shares because it's pretty much a done deal on Friday anyway, right? Now, Typically, as I would have to say for this entire episode, for this entire season up at these nine episodes, Alex has gotten MVP status, right? The way she moves, the way she talks, the way she does, Alex has, has been on top as MVP. Unfortunately, due to current certain recent events, Alex has lost her MVP status and the new MVP of this episode goes to Chris Hunter, right? Because somehow, some way, I don't know whether her black mama called her, whether her grandmama called her, whether her sister friend called her and told her, girl, the word on the street is you be as about to get sold. Those white people ain't gonna think thinking about your black ass with your ancient mama shit, with your going on writing shit on mirrors and all this stuff. So you need to get your hell and you get your black ass up out of there very quickly because they're not gonna be thinking about you. And when the shit from them dust motherfucking settles, it's not gonna matter 
how many times Paul Marks smiled at you at a fashion show, they probably would get rid of you anyway, right? So her husband comes in and is like, hey, I got an offer. Your favorite sports network wants you. They say you could do hard news. And she's like, is this going to be this UBA bullshit where they, like, they bring me in, but they really don't need you? They really don't really want to make change? And he's like, no, no, no. They really, they're really serious. I think we should shake it up. I hope Chris leaves. I hope she's like, y'all are going to be done using me. You, I ain't going to be your Miss Seely. I ain't going to be your Queenie. Just be done with it and just leave. Just sometimes in life, you just got to let white people be white, right? Sometimes you have to exit the situation because your black presence is such a distraction to what is really going on that you just need to stop and let white people be white. And I hope Chris takes it. But the fact that she floated it gets her the MVP status for this episode because Alex done lost her damn whole ass motherfucking mind. But we'll get to that in a second. Now... Maggie Haberman shows up, and I love Marsha Gay Harden. Again, they just pulled out all the favorites for this episode. So Marsha Gay Harden shows up, and I love the Maggie Haberman character because she is the only person. She's Alex's kryptonite. She's the only person that gets to Alex because, one, she sees Alex for who she is, and B, she is Alex, right? So the problem is, is that Maggie Haberman acts, the character acts as a mirror to Alex, which agitates Alex, the character, right? Because the way all the things that Maggie Haberman does and moves, Alex gets really upset about are all the ways that Alex moves, right? But since Alex has come down with the epidemic, ver epidemic case of cognitive dissonance, she does not realize that her and Maggie Haberman are pretty much the same fucking person, right? So anyway, so Maggie comes in and she does just a masterful, just scene with such a masterful scene because she knows Alex is still salty about the, the, the whole book. Because remember, it's the book that sent Alex over to Italy to go to get to go to curse out Mitch within him unaliving un himself and the whole situation, right? And she's like, you know what, girl? First, she, she does the knock and the walk. She doesn't knock and stop. She knocks and walks. And she's like, hey, girl, how you doing? Swings her purse down. Oh, can I sit? Mind you, she's already sitting. And she's like, you know what? I have to apologize. You know, like, I know we didn't leave things greatly, you know, the great the last time, but you've done good with yourself, girl. And whatever. She totally disarms Alex by giving her, by complimenting her, right? Because Alex, like the men she works with, has an enormous ego, right? So she just starts complimenting her and whatever, and then she asks Alex, she's like, so girl, what are you going to do? Like, you know when things settle, like you may or may not be here and you too smart to just be left up to the whims of these men, right? She's like, I don't know. I was thinking, I'm sure I'll come up with something. Very cute because, you know, she's on a, she's a, she's part of the butcher company that's about to butcher the company. And Maggie's like, girl, I'm sure you'll be fine because if, if I was in your situation, I'd be fine, right? <clears throat> so then Alex takes this on opportunity. They'd be like, hey, how long do you think UBA would last? Like, how do, what do you think the future is of the whole thing? And Maggie's like, girl, it's like three to five years. Like, Paul Marks throwing all this money. Yeah, y'all got three to five years. But pretty much all these legacy media companies are going to end up, you know, selling each other out or just dying. So again, Maggie Haberman provides Alex with the more relativism she needs to make her piss poor decision, Right. And Alex is like, oh, okay. So mind you, Alex calls Paul and says the banker lowball the assets and that Paul is going to make an easy $10 billion off the entire, you know, once he butchers up the company or whatever like that, right? So before Maggie Haberman left, she was like, you know what? How's Bradley doing? And she's like, girl, Bradley's Bradley in, you know, whatever. Fight a good fight. She goes, I really like the way Bradley stood up for you. That was really good. So again, so she's like, ooh, okay. Since I'm going to come on, go through with this bullshit idea, let's get Bradley on board, right? So she goes down to see Bradley. She's like, hey, girl, how's it going? Because if you recall from the, you know, from the earlier reviews, they've been operating in their separate universes, right? Now, or if you think of it in a narrative sense, they're separate storylines. Now the storylines are intersecting. Bradley's storyline, Alex's storyline are intersecting. And she's like, hey, girl, 
I, you know, what are you thinking? I'm thinking we'll go out and do something different. Go out, go out on my own. Like Alex is telling half the truth, but she ain't telling the full truth. And she's like, girl, I thought that the whole bullshit we did with Fred and them was because we're going to do, you know, make changes here. She's like, yeah, girl, I know, but I feel like we could do something better on our own. I want you to come with me. And Bradley's like, nah, I'm good. I'm going to make, stay here and make changes. But just so you know, I think this is about the man you fucking and he ain't good. And so, I, how, do you know him? What do you know about him? Feels like things are going fast. And Alex thinks straight up in her feelings. She's like, how can you be so naive? You don't know anything about my man. My man is good to me. He's all the man that I need. And, and Bradley's like, girl, like, you need to get a hold of yourself. Like, like, what do you think, right? And then I was just like, okay. So then Bradley's like, okay, girl, do you do whatever, right? Now... Laura's nosy ass calls how inviting him to come to Washington, D.C. for the 4th of July. And then she's like, have you ever been to the 4th of July? And she's like, no, I haven't been to the 4th of July. But it's on the phone, so she, but somehow she knows he's lying, and she's all torn up about it, right? And I was like, the fuck? How? Get you some business. So we'll begin. I'll, I'll get to Laura in a second. Now, Alice comes home. And to her homosexual billionaire who was taking takeout food out of bag. No private chef. I was like, what the fuck is this? So then Alice comes in and says she's ready. So here we go. Let me, let me, let, let's break this shit down with Alice, right? The character of Alex Levy is why people say white women cannot be trusted, right? Because at the end of the day, right, Alex, her own power... Her own sense of purpose always comes from being connected to a powerful white man, right? Because later on in the episode, Corey will come and confront her, and her and her her theory and argument against Corey is correct that she's never had a seat at the table. But bitch, you don't have a seat at the table now. Your seat is alone from a man who's not even your husband. Because it would be one thing if Alex was mortgaging her apartment, selling her jewels, selling her furs to put her to put the money up for this new studio. But that's not how it's working, right? She's using Paul Marx's money and she's going to build her own studio. So, so once again, Alex will be at the behest of a man who she's sleeping with, right, to start and launch her career. So she is in no better situation with Paul Marx than she is with Corey. The only difference is she's not fucking Corey. Corey wants to fuck Bradley. And that is not a probable situation to Alex because Alex always wants to be connected to the man in charge who she has fucked or wants to fuck her, A.K. Mitch, when we, when, when we started this whole season, right? So Alex's logic to do this whole bullshit is ridiculous. The fact is... This whole, this Paul Marks man is going to dupe you so bad, you're going to throw yourself in a whole ass Hudson River. Because my theory is, is that he purposely wanted Alex and wanted Alex part of this deal so that if he could throw his big, thick dick all, all on Alex, she would be so mesmerized, she would not look into him, right? Because he could take care of Bradley, right? Because once again, think about it. Bradley's the one with the secret. Bradley's the one who's investigating. Alex just wrote a book right? All of Alex's business is out there. The fact that she slept with Mitch, that was the lad, the very last thing, the very last secret that anyone could hold over Alex. And then she tells it, right? And now Mitch is dead. So the only person that could have stopped this deal, he takes out not with blackmail, not with extortion, not with robbery, but with his thick dick. And that is just such a shame, right? And this is why people will not, do not like aligning themselves with white women because at the end of the day, white women will always move or always align themselves to the closest proximity to white male hegemonic power for their sense of purpose, for their sense of survival, and then wrap it up in the fact that they're getting a seat at the table. You only get a seat at a table that you motherfucking made, right? So Alex, girl, I mean, you get, you have gotten MVP status for three seasons. And, you know, I understand everybody falters, but girl, this ain't the way you want to go out. This is a whole ass mess. You're going to get your heart broken. Your pussy still may be sore, but this just, I, I mean, again, I, the dick math just may net you zero because 
16 nights with Paul Ham and getting humiliated all over the world may end up be worth it, but I don't know. Like I, with with John Ham, like 16 nights of being digged down by with by John Ham and getting publicly humiliated all over the world, it nets you out zero. But that's all you got is zero, right? So that's my thing with Alex because she's a whole ass fool. Now, sorry, I was reading her so bad. I, okay. Now, Stella and Bradley go to Corey, right? So they go to Corey, tell him, tell, tell them what they're worried about. And Corey ain't hearing it. He wants the deal to go through. He's like, this can't stop it. Everything's happening. Y'all just need to go back. And Bradley's like, look, I'm gonna keep looking at this. Now, Bradley gets a text message from Laura. It's like, I need you to come over. So Bradley's like, oop, gotta go. And then Stella's like, look, I didn't try to tell you. I maybe didn't try to tell you hard enough, but Paul Marks is dangerous. This is not a good thing. And I was just like, huh, okay. And Stella just says, you know what? I'm not gonna be here when this deal goes through. I don't be, I done been through this Paul Marks shenanigans. You may be newly infected. I done went through the plague. I'm done, right? Now, Amanda calls Paul and gives some dirt, um, and gives Paul some dirt on Corey, right? And it also says that Bradley is still looking and she's gonna get somebody to talk eventually. And Kate took some shit, so it may be Kate, right? Now, Bradley goes sees Laura. Here's our second library opening for the day. She goes to see Laura, and Laura goes into her full Karen S mode, don't touch me, get away from me, and exposes the fact that she knew that Bradley and Corey covered up Hal's January 6th insurrection participation, right? Let us break this down. Laura is not mad because her girlfriend did not confide, did not trust her enough to confide in her something important that happened in Bradley's life. Laura is mad because as a white entitled woman, Bradley did not tell her and, and, and Laura feels like most white women feel that a problem in their proximity is a problem they must inject themselves into. There is no, look, the way this conversation would have gone in real whole ass life is, girl, did, do you know I don't, look, okay, look, true tea, I was on the internet because I think you're a fucking Corey, right? And I find out what the fuck you did with how. Girl, what are you going to do with this? Like, how are you going to do this? And you start promising them together. But Laura makes this about her and the moral high ground of being a reporter on the evening news. Who the fuck is watching the evening news and believe half the shit they see in the evening news? Maybe people do. I'm not one of those people. But Laura whole ass this and then says, oh, how could you? And then it's just high key man. And Bradley's here crying. I would have tore up that whole motherfucking house. I would have cussed Laura the dog fuck out. Not because I was right in lying to the FBI. Not because I was right in not telling you. But for you to inject yourself into my bullshit and to make it about you. That somehow or another, people would discredit you. You would be discredited because people would say, would think that you knew. All you have to say is you didn't know. Because you did not know that you actually still don't know because I just kind of confirmed it for you. But you could have just gone in and acted like you don't know that you there's no proof that they told you. And if you really love this, this is why I told y'all Laura wasn't shit all along from the beginning of the season. All this. I want Bradley back. I miss you trying to fuck up in Corey's house and all this shit. So this is what it took. This is what this is what it took for you to be done with Bradley that you've been trying to get with for the whole last like nine motherfucking episodes. You ain't shit. Laura ain't shit. She thinks about herself. She's selfish. She entitled. She's snobby. She's ridiculous. Bradley can find her a better, 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 better chick. And I was just like, oh, I would have twelve that whole motherfucking house. Even if, even if I was wrong. Even if I was wrong. And so anyway. Sybil shows up, right? And I love me a good old Sybil scene because it kind of reminds me of um, old lady Tyrell from uh, Game of Thrones because once old white women get to a certain point in a certain class structure, they just like to read people from filth. Now, Sybil does no way in the same realm or league um, as old lady Tyrell from Game of Thrones, but it just makes it reminiscent. So she comes hobbling in and is like, hey, I'm here to see Corey," And she shows up and reads him for filth and being like, look, whatever Paul Marx is like trying to buy your soul for, 
I'll fucking double it or whatever. But, I, but you had me all the way fucked up thinking that I was going to let my family's company get come up and get sold by you and whoever the fuck you think thought you were. Of course, like, there's nothing you can motherfucking do. And soon enough, UBA be the largest network with the deepest pockets, and she straight up laughs in his face. Like, you motherfucking fool, I ran into Genevieve Micklin, who can't stand me because I fired her fucking pervy-ass husband and rubbed it in my face. My family's company got about to get butchered up, and her husband is helping. Corey has a complete meltdown, right? But he keeps it together. He's like, okay, have a good day, Sybil. So then he runs to the elevator. He's trying to call Paul. He's like, whatever. And then he goes and like starts to like punch the elevator. So then he finally gets in the elevator with bleeding hands, walking to Alex's office. Now, typically you guys know I would go up for a good old Corey and Alex fight. But you know, after I've already read Alex for filth, I just like, I think Corey should read you down for fifth, Alex. Not that Corey's right, but because your moral relativism is totally skewed, right? But the truth is, Alex is right. Under you, I had no seat at the table. At least I have a seat at a table that I did not build with another man's, with another man that I'm sleeping with or whatever. And then Corey just has no moral high ground because he's right. Like you're in it for your ego and the money. You don't care about these people. If you cared about these people, you would've been trying to cut their salaries and doing all this shit where like the black people and the, you know, we're all getting underpaid or whatever like that. So anyway, she's like, you know what? And plus then Alex says it, lets it out that she's gonna take most of the employees with her, right? After the sale goes, you know, after all this is butchered up. So Corey's on the phone with Leonard. He's trying to find that. Alex calls Paul. He's like, oh my God, Corey knows. Paul's like, don't worry. He like jungle books her again, you know, with the swirly eyes and the thick dick via phone, right? And she's like, okay, well, I'm going to go home. Paul's like, eh, take me to UBA. I'm going to see UBA real quick, right? So Bradley's, Bradley's getting ready to do her evening news, whatever. Girl is just going through it. She's drinking whiskey out the fucking, out her drawer or whatever. And then all of a sudden... Paul Mark shows up. She's like, oh, I gotta go. I gotta do the news. He's like, well, this won't take a second. He's like, I only got 30 seconds. So what a, he's like, I know you're investigating me. I know you ain't got nothing. So why don't you just let this go? She's like, no, you up to no good. Your company's dirty. And I'm gonna motherfucking find out. So then she's like, how's your brother doing? And, and her poker face was like, what do you mean? What I mean is, How's your brother doing since you, since you and Corey covered up his whole insurrection participation, right? And she was like, what are you talking about, right? Not a good poker face, but she didn't admit shit like she did with motherfucking Laura, right? So then she goes, but then what about Laura? Now Laura could be in trouble because Laura knew. Screech! Child, that just happened like 45 minutes ago. How did Paul Marks know that Laura knew? He has their phone bugs. He has their phone bugs. He has been behind the breach, behind that hack. He has had everybody in surveillance. I'm telling you, Paul, how has been, he has been playing everybody and everybody is about to get duped. So I was just like, oh my God. So then Bradley, so now he's like, you know what? If you let this whole thing drop, I want out your brother. I won't fuck around with you and Laura. I won't fuck around with Corey. The whole thing's over, right? So now Bradley is shooketh, right? Because it's one thing for Laura to know, because Laura said she was gonna call the FBI. But, but, but when Lex Luthor with the thick dick decides that he's gonna fucking do knows about it, we it's, it's problematic, right? So anyway, so Corey is so Bradley gets on air and she like stumbles and stammers, and child Bradley just resigns right there. She's like, you know what? This is too much. This is too much. This is too much. I am done. Thank you for the honor. I hereby resign for personal reasons. So Stella's like, the whole fuck? So Stella gets up in her Yeezys with her dread long skirt on and is running down the halls trying to look for Bradley. She runs to Bradley and Bradley's like, nope, 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 not today. And she's like fucking, she's fucking done. Corey's up in his office like, she ain't answering her phone. What's going on? Whatever. And Stella's like, <clears throat> did you see this? She's like, of course I saw it. She's like, nah, 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 nah. The Vault just released the article. Now, remember the Vault is like their TMZ or whatever like that, a scandal. 
The Vault just released an article that you were grooming Bradley, that you like got her in a hotel room down the hall from you, and that you were secretly in love with her. And the re and when you found out that she was a lesbian, you decided to out her via the Vault. And Stella's like, "Well, is this true? Is this true?" And I'm like. Of course it's true, girl. Why are you asking if it's true? But before we can even get an answer from Corey, who literally at this point, like if I was Corey, I just would have fainted on the floor, right? Like this would have been, like I'm not a fainty type of bitch, but after the day that I had, I probably would have been drunk or whatever. But he can't get no glass. He can't get no smelling salts because Kyle comes in and says, uh, security's here and they about to walk you out. So that was the episode... <laughs> Once again, that was fan-fucking-tastic. I am ready, ready, ready. I may do a live with a with a live reaction after the season finale this week. We're going to see. But, um, yeah, that was pretty good, guys. So let me know what you think. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to comment. Don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you guys soon. Bye.